Good afternoon, Michigan, and welcome back to the Nest Radio Station. I'm your host, Sarah Mead. Today, we have a very special live broadcast for you. She's a trailblazer in the legal field, a champion for female empowerment, the chief deputy of the state of Michigan's attorney general's office, and the newest member of the prestigious Joins Miller Johnson Law Firm. Please welcome Ms. Fedwa Hamoud to the Nest Radio Station. <laughs> It's an absolute honor to have you with us. Now, Ms. Hamoud, you've had and continue to build upon a remarkable career. Can you please share with our listeners a little bit about yourself, starting with your roots here in the community and abroad? Well, thank you for that warm introduction. Mm -hmm. Let me just say I'm so excited to be a part of this podcast, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Of course. So I think, you know, my story, my story is probably very familiar. It's a story that one way or another. Um, my story is one that I was discovered was so very difficult and so very difficult in any other country in the world. That has been a great story. I was born in Lebanon and my family and I in Lebanon uh, with my brother uh, when I was about 11 and a half years old. And that had a lot to do with my story and my pursuit of the law. Um, I came here and went to Whitlam Public School. I had a great public school education, and I'll say this because it really shaped who I am today and why it's so important for me throughout my career in public education. Uh, my parents were not, did not come from money by any means. I uh, came here and I think I was able to be in the position that I am today in my previous And you know, I think at an early age, I started to see some of the injustices. You know, when we talk about the law, how did you get here? Um, and how did you start this career? You know, I lived on Miller Road. You guys are probably familiar yeah. with it. I live there in Southeast, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in East yeah. Dearborn. And I always say the story because it's important to me. What separated Dearborn from Detroit was one street, and it was tire men. Yeah. And Literally, it's one stone, stone throw away, and I had friends on the other side of the fire. It didn't necessarily, just by, just by one street difference, did not have the same public education that I had. Well, did not have the same opportunities that I had, right? And that was very evident, and it became even more evident when I started my career at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office as a prosecutor. For one of the hardest things that I think I witnessed were many of my defendants, they could not even read their constitutional rights. And it leads me back to why I think it's so important to be here with me today. And it, it takes it back to education. Is I think that this is a tool, uh, this is a, a weapon that you have, that we have here, that um, could really change the trajectory life and I think that it did mine so I uh, through that um, I was able to learn the language uh, I've had you know struggles and uh, ended up pursuing a career in the law because I always wanted to advocate uh, you know I uh, as someone who grew up in Lebanon I can tell you that I I and lived under occupation at the time, uh, felt a lot of injustices around me. And at the same time, I didn't feel like there was a mechanism, that there was a court system, there was something in place in which I could advocate or someone could advocate for me and kids like me. So I've always had, and I think it, it, this is something that a lot of people with trauma kind of carry with them. I think that many of us, many of our parents, from war or occupied countries, carry that trauma with them. So we always have this fight in us to make things better, to speak on behalf of people that can't speak for themselves. And that's something that I wanted to carry through and, and really pursue in my career, which led me to uh, 
uh, my career at Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, which I would love to tell you guys about too, mm -hmm. hopefully during this podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2019, I was uh, appointed as the Solicitor General for the state. And, uh, and then after that, I served in my current role right now, which I will have until March 8th, yeah. as the Chief Deputy Attorney General for the state. And it has just been an honor. So, but I'm sure we'll get into more details as we, as we go through this awesome well. conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes. It really inspired, inspired like everything you do is just it's amazing. But speaking specifically to your legal career, can you tell us some challenges that you face as a female and people who make challenges for them? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll tell you a story. Uh, so I really, so my dad is my biggest dad. Mm -hmm. right. So when I went to the Supreme Court, I got hired, and, and, uh, which was very, very exciting. Tell us about that? I have to tell you guys all about it. Uh, I remember a news station came in and turned the law Oh, wow. And they had lots of, you know, received lots of news because this was the first time in the Arab in the Muslim majority. And, and I, I want to tell you guys this, it's so important to me, you know, that we start breaking that, that mm -hmm. phrase, that we start breaking that trend. You know, I'm sick and tired of, of the first. Yeah. We, we want to make this more. He went and took this job. I remember my husband, Nadi, who's also my greatest ever. I told him, listen, we're in this together. Because as a woman, when you're taking a position like this, you have to have a team around for you. And that's a struggle. Like when we talk about different struggles in the mm -hmm. career, you really need allies around you that understand, especially when we are going into institutions that for so, you know, for a long period of time, we really didn't belong. It has to be a village, right? And I remember telling him, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to need your full support. And he said, all right. And I told you guys about my daughter, Julia, earlier yeah. before we went on there. And he said, Think that you would have a daughter, that your daughter would eventually be here arguing in front of the ice, you know, court in the land. And my dad did anything for me, and he said, Oh, absolutely. <laughs> because he truly believes, you know, in, in me. And that I think I have carried with me, you know, when, when people around us, when we empower each other, when we say this is the norm. It becomes within reach. Mm -hmm. And when I first wanted to go to law school, I didn't have any attorneys in my family. I didn't have any connections or, you know, didn't know someone that I could talk to. And I remember my dad had found someone and uh, he had asked if that person would meet with him and I. And this person was an attorney. And I said, you know, so excited for all this, they could even meet someone who couldn't wait, right? Couldn't wait to, to talk to someone who's in this field and I really wanted to be. And this man said, you know, well, uh, what do you what do you plan on doing? I said, I'm going to be an attorney. And I don't know any attorneys, I'm so excited to be here. And my dad was with me. And this man looked at my father and he told him, you know, if your daughter wants to have a family one day, you know, she really should choose another career. Oh my God. And uh, yeah, that was, you know, I mean, imagine being so excited to meet with someone. Yes. And regardless, the only thing I'll say about this story is that my father looked at me while this man was in my presence. He said, you know, fool, fool, because that's what my dad <laughs> so calls me. Yeah. <laughs> And some judges called me that too. Which is very <laughs> very <laughs> very <laughs> but he said, you know, throughout your career, throughout your life, many people are going to throw bricks at you. Mm -hmm. Make sure you take those and you continue to build a solid foundation with those bricks that they throw at you. So, you know, being in this field, many people would 
would would think should a woman really do a job yes. like this? I'll tell you one of my first days, even at the attorney general's office, I'd be in a lot of meetings. And my male colleagues would not address me. They would address someone else who happens to be an older male. And uh, and then I learned to stand up for myself. Then I learned to call it out. Mm -hmm. Then I learned to tell people in meetings, do I make you uncomfortable? Because if I do, I'll replace you by somebody else to make sure that you are comfortable. But at the same time, to build those relationships and to be patient, mm -hmm. right? And to understand that um, every every single road is, is going to be challenging in one way or another. But I think it makes it so much easier to know that we're in this together. Mm -hmm. And even though I didn't have that support in the beginning, I'll tell you that as a woman, I have I have been throughout my career uh, uplifted and surrounded by amazing women who have really made my achievements a collective one and not one alone, right? Because empowered women empower women. And I think that once we have this coalition, we can move past that exception. Mm -hmm. We can move past that, oh, she did, she said, oh, she can, can, can we really do this? Mm -hmm. And that's when we start making the norm. I'm really glad you proved those people wrong. Yeah. That, that mm -hmm. was your yeah, empowered women, empowered yeah, I'm women. I'm not going to Did what he tell you, did the, what, the, attorney, the attorney that you had met, did what he tell you inspire you to keep going, to prove him wrong? Honestly, you know, at first I was, I remember feeling very defeated, mm -hmm. right? Naturally, was, of course. But that's why it was important that I had a male ally next to me like my father. Um, and that's why we really need each other to pick each other up. Uh, we're, we're all human. We're going to have those moments where we're going to break down, right? I have those moments all the time till today. Uh, always, am I doing enough? You know, am I reading with Heavy and Julia enough? Am I playing with them enough? Am I doing enough for my colleagues at work? Am I reading every single case that I can? And at the end of the day, I can go to sleep at night every day knowing that I'm trying, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not trying mediocre. I know that I'm trying. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I've proven to myself time and time again, that once I do that, once I give my all to something, no matter what the consequences are, I'm good with it. It's a great way to live. Yeah, honestly. Your hard work is really admirable. Thank you for sharing. Now, could you share some of the strategies that you've implemented to promote female empowerment within the legal profession? And for me, if I was like a high school female student, I am. Oh, and <laughs> if I wanted to become a attorney or enter the legal profession, this one, where do you think I should start, and how would I get in? Well, you should start today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is such a good question. I can tell you that when I was at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, even at the Attorney General's Office, and um, beyond, I have made a point to have a coalition of women. At the AG's office, uh, I, I call it, I had a, a great mentor who had since passed away. Her name is Kelly Rossman McKinney. She was the communications director for the state and she passed the on to me. But we had a group called Chicks in Charge. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I was at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, uh, we, we we had the same concept is that we would find each other, especially Arab American women, mm -hmm. right? Especially Arab American Muslim women. Is, as soon as we found each other, it was like laser focused in the hall. <laughs> and I'm still like that. When I look at application of who's applying to the office, when I look at people looking for internships, you best believe that's the first place that my eyes are going to go. Because it is so important, again, that once one of us is somewhere in an institution, that we have to kick that door wide open, right? Mm -hmm. And make that ceiling the new floor. And so I think being surrounded by a coalition of women, and not necessarily just Arab American women, I'll tell you to answer your question. When I first met Kim Worthy, Prosecutor Kim Worthy, um, I remember being at an event, it was a Martin Luther King event, 
And I like to say the story because I really hope that it resonates and that you take that, you know each and every single one of you can take something away from it because um well I'll just tell the story. <laughs> so I was at an event and this is prior to law school. Right. Sorry, I wasn't in law school yet. You guys are not in law school yet. No, we're but still in high school. <laughs> in fall, the fall, hopefully. <laughs> Inshallah. So, I um, it was a Martin Luther King event, and now this is after that attorney, the story that I told mm -hmm. you. And I saw this woman of color, prosecutor, would be a strong black woman who is one of the strongest attorneys one of the first women of color to be elected prosecutor. And I felt like just by who she was, being a white woman, being a woman of color, I felt like her office was within reach, right? Mm -hmm. I felt like I can talk to her. And yeah. that's the power of when we talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion, is that you feel, if, if okay, if I was at the Attorney General's office, I, I, the yeah, institution yeah, yeah. welcomes me. Mm -hmm. And I felt like Kim Morby, just by who she is, being another woman of color, I felt like I could talk to her. So I went up to her after, and I introduced myself. And that's another thing that my father taught me, right? Is when you meet someone, look them in the eye, introduce yourself, make sure the, the importance of relationships, importance of relationships. And I remember telling her, my name is Fadla Halali. This is before I got married. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm going to email you one day, and I hope you remember my name. And I'm going to go to law school. And after I graduated, I did email her. Now, I had, at that time, lots of allies at the prosecutor's office. There were a couple of Arab Americans that were hired there. And I was going to email her. I said, my name is Fadla Halali. I hope you remember my name. She did. Oh my God. And she invited me to her office. And I remember my first meeting with her, first conversation. And she said, Well, why do you work with government? And this is this is just me meeting with her. I just mm -hmm. asked, let me sit down with you. But I just, you know, finished law school to well, take my bar exam. She said, Well, why would you want to work for the government? Work for the government. And I said, You know, I am so sick and tired of protesting you from the outside that I really would like to make things, you know, I'd like to make some changes from the inside. Mm -hmm. I remember meaning, leaving that meeting thinking, what did you do? <laughs> Why did you say that? Are you ever going to be <laughs> going back to the prosecutor's office? And she hired me. And she hired me before I got my P number, before I actually became an attorney. Yeah. And it was because it was yet another woman of color who believed in me. Mm -hmm. And that was just so important to me and, and has really impacted my career in so many positive ways. I still call her, her and I talk on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she has supported me and uplifted me and continued to do what we you know, root for me throughout throughout my journey. Sweet. So, yeah. yeah. And it's a part of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we, we must yeah. continue to do that. It's it's so obvious from the way you talk about it that you you're really impassioned about this yeah. topic. I can tell just from now that you're very dedicated to this cause. Um, in order to you know commemorate, I could say your last week in this position as the chief deputy of the attorney general office. Can you tell us what life was like in the office? What did you do exactly? How did you manage your life? Oh my goodness. Ah, <laughs> uh, I can't believe. I'll come into that. <laughs> I'll part of me. I started as the Reserve General of the state, and with that position, you're probably like, well, what's so this? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what solicitor sort of means. <laughs> so, Solicitor General for the state is basically it's a, it's an appointed position, it's a statutory position, it's in our constitution, and it is the top uh, appellate attorney that oversees all of the cases that are in our highest courts and I would approve them and, my, and oversee everything that is appellate. So the Attorney General's office represents client agencies that that is the state and also the people of the state of Michigan. So have you guys heard of the Department of Health and Human Services? Yeah. That is our client. 
and the Attorney General's office represents the different departments. Have you guys held, uh, uh, heard of the Michigan Department of Corrections? Yeah. yeah. State agency, so we would represent them. The governor, that's that's a state officer. We represent her. The Secretary of State, Michigan Department, you know, of, of uh, licensing and regulations. Those are all our clients. And at the same time, you know, you bring forward cases uh, that impact the people. There's also a prosecutorial line to the Attorney General's office. But that, those are the technicalities. Can talk about those. Those are not as interesting as <laughs> what do you do on a daily basis? I want to hear your life. <laughs> so I believe it or not, supervise about six hundred people and mm -hmm. manage a budget mm -hmm. of over a hundred and twenty million dollars. Oh, <laughs> Who's gonna trust us with all of that? <laughs> I'm gonna go shopping. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't do that <laughs> as much as I would have loved to. Uh, no, I couldn't do that. And, and this, that's the thing. When you are entrusted with the people's trust, right, when you have to truly be that representation. And here, here's another thing. When you are a person of color or a minority, anything that I do is different than if a Josh Smith was to do. Yeah, right? yeah. represents all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. So if, if, if I were to do something that is, you know, fraudulent or scandalous, or sometimes just me being me, I understand that this position was never mine alone, right? So what do you do in this position? You carry yourself in a way to make sure that you are not the last, to make sure that we set an example, especially when our positions all of a sudden come with our nationality and our religion mm -hmm. attached to them. Yeah. Because that's the reality of things. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. So if I were to do something, it's not just Fadwa Hamoud did something. It's Muslim American, first Muslim solicitor general, you know, mm -hmm. first yeah. Muslims argued from the Supreme Court. And with that came, you know, I'll tell you as exciting as that was, my God, <laughs> when I first got this position, how many letters I received from people across the country that were uh, that were threatening. I mean, there were a couple of times where I did have to have, you know, the state would send security outside of my house. It's not something that I would even share with, with my family when they were out there because I didn't want my kids to be scared. I didn't want, you know, my, my parents to be scared. But I received many letters, um, you know, about my religion, about my faith, about what I'm doing in, in, in the office, uh, about the fact that I'm there to enforce Sharia and uh, and I always I heard this joke one time, so I use it. Uh, is you know, if I'm enforcing anything, it's shawarma law. And <laughs> it got so much better when I started. Who doesn't love shawarma? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so it did. It did come. You know, it does come with its challenges. Um, you know, even, even when I went to the United States Supreme Court, I think that that was such an exciting experience for me. When I was there at the hotel, a group of Somalian women, all wearing the hijab, came and found me. And they had lived in D.C. for so long. And they're like, you know, we've heard that you're here because it had made the news there. And they said, we feel like this building, this, the, the Supreme Court building, is, is our building. Mm -hmm. And they rooted me on and supported me. And at the same time, there was an individual, when I finished my argument, and it was during COVID, so my family couldn't go in there. Uh, yeah. They were they were in D.C. They, they surprised me there. I didn't know that my family was there. And um, they, they, they went to surprise me, so I'm doing this argument. And as soon as I finish my argument, I'm literally uh, being carried away by security. And I was so confused. What's happening? You know, they're they're rushing me out of there. And security's grabbing me to take me out the building. And I see my family, and I see the attorney general, and I see my colleagues, and everybody is scared and terrified. And there was actually a man from from Michigan who found out that I'm going to be in the building and went there. And there was a bathroom at the building that I was oh in. Oh my god! So, oh yeah. And, and, and we don't talk about that really often because it's so important for, for this process to happen because mm -hmm. until we continue going through 
you know, and not giving up on this and not being discouraged. We're never going to get to the norm. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to me that you don't take that away from the story. It is the girls from all over the country uh, that, that really felt like they can mm -hmm. or that they belong, right? Or, you know, uh, you know, certain certain letters. I got a letter from a woman in New York whose family, you know, doesn't talk to her uh, because she has a child from, um, and she ended up marrying a Middle Eastern man. I don't know her, but she wrote me a letter. She sent me a picture of her daughter, and her parents were very <coughs> racist against Muslims. And uh, she sent me a picture of my article clipping and. She sent her parents who don't talk to her because her daughter is a Muslim. She sent them a note, you know, I hope my daughter grows up to be like the Muslims in this country. Uh, those are the stories that you take away. But that work has to continue. And there will be struggles. And not everybody is going to be okay with people that look like you and I. But quite frankly, people that look like Kim Worthy or, or other minorities in certain positions. But that is why we have to, and we must continue to break those barriers. And just like I did that at the, you know, at the attorney general's office, I plan to do that in the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going into the private sector because I also believe that we belong in boardrooms. This is one of the you know, largest firms in, in our state. They're mm -hmm. huge on the west side of the state. They don't have not one Arab American Muslim there. And it is my every intention to make sure that they have an Arab American Muslim leading it into success in a way it hasn't been done before. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to manifest that and I'm going to make that happen. You know. So again, the old ceiling is the new floor as we continue to shatter them in different spaces where we belong. And not only do we belong in every single one of those spaces, we get in there and we excel once given the opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to take advantage yeah. of those opportunities. Because so many you know, I understand that I'm in this position, not just because I'm public for me or, or the way I was raised, but I was given certain opportunities that I took full advantage of. School, law school was not always easy. And we're talking about school and how difficult that's going to be. But it's temporary. Mm -hmm. And other people have done it. And you're going to do it. And probably do it better. <laughs> Well, I want to run up a pause real quick. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Someone who wants to go into law, truly, truly, it's so inspiring to be able to speak to you. Because everything you just said, I've unfortunately have heard of people all around. I've heard discouraging words too. And it's so motivating coming from someone who's already done it that I can do it. It really is. And I know you can. And, and I think that it takes, it takes you once once you believe in you, then the rest of the world will start believing in you. And you have to reflect that, and you have to reflect that energy. Uh, and I personally can't wait to see uh, what you're going to do. I can't wait to email you in a few years. Do you remember my <laughs> name? <laughs> so the reason why I mentioned that story about Prosecutor Worthy and why I really want you guys to, what I want you guys to take from this is, is that relationship that we talked about, right? When you meet someone, Take their business card. Mm -hmm. Follow up with them. Continue those conversations. You know, you asked, you know, how, how do I go about uh, going into this field or continuing, you know, who, who do I, what's the first step? It's, it's steps like this. It's having a conversation, right? And oftentimes it's like so hard for us. Am I going to go up to this person? Am I going to talk to them? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's nerve wracking. It's scary. People are human and you... You, you really, people would appreciate, you guys are already leaders, but don't sit on the sidelines. I mean, if you sit on the sidelines, you're never gonna play the game. Go in there. And the first step is building relationships, right? Building a, a, a connection, but following up on those relationships. What's the point of, you know, meeting me today? If, if you want to go to law school and then you never reach out, yeah, great. I met somebody great. What was the point of me meeting prosecutor worthy? So I can always say I met prosecutor worthy. No, I'm going to follow up on that. And I know that that relationship that started 
will hopefully eventually help the next person and the next person. And then you, your relationship that you start, like we started this conversation, are going to help my Julia and my daughter and her friends and others. Uh, because this is a collective movement. And especially being minorities, people of color, um, our movement must be collective and our achievements must be collective. And our achievements can never be individual. Whether we like it or not, they must be collective for us to continue advancing and opening doors for ourselves as a community. And like we stated, just by the nature of who we are, when we enter those spaces, we carry each other with us. So when I succeed, you succeed. When you succeed, I succeed. And we need to keep that mentality and keep uplifting each other and finding spaces for each other. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that so much. I love this. <laughs> I love this. I like so much. <laughs> I hope you brought business cards with you because I will be sure. Oh, to well, I have old business cards, but the, the, because I'm moving, yeah, the job, yeah. I'm going to be starting at Miller Johnson, but that doesn't matter because I am going to give you my contact information. Perfect. Anyways, and I'll you call have you every awesome day. people <laughs> here that know how to get a hold of me. <laughs> And you do have great men allies in this room as well. So we are this awesome woman empowerment conversation too. It's, it's so great to be in this facility and a part of this podcast. I've enjoyed it a lot. And I'm so happy I came with you guys. <laughs> I'm gonna, so right now we're gonna play a little game, okay? Ooh. This game, I know we already know a lot about that, but we kinda wanna know sort of the basics, you know, it's just like, are you more of a that's too short tell a girl, okay? <laughs> no, right, a hard question. So this this game is called Rapid Fire. It's gonna take around 30 seconds to a minute long. I'm just gonna give you a series of questions and then they're rapid fired from there. So the second you finish answering one question, I'm already asking you the next, okay? okay. And so like I said, <laughs> you, got this at all. you got this. Um and like you said, they're like I said, they're more to get to know you on a personal level. Um beyond the legal field, okay? Okay. So are you ready? Yes. <laughs> All right. So what is your favorite flavor of Fago Pop? Cotton candy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awful. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> what do you like better, a meat shawarma or a chicken shawarma sandwich? Chicken shawarma. Okay, good choice. That's my favorite, too. Favorite <laughs> flavor of better made chips? What was, what's my favorite flavor? Yeah. Sweet barbecue. Oh, I love that, too. Okay. For dinner, do you prefer fatouche or tabouli? The booty. Okay, I'm more of a fatouche girl, but I'll let that slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, finish the sentence. On a sunny day in Michigan, I would rather bike, rollerblade, or walk? Uh, bike. Okay. Um, what is your go-to meal for a thought after fasting all day? Um, we call it in Arabic, Nashid al-Watani, the national mm -hmm. anthem, which is fatouche, uh, soup and uh, fries. But the no, I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. All right. Favorite lake to visit on a hot day in Michigan? Lake Michigan. Okay. And then last question. Finish the sentence. In the winter, I hibernate or make a snowman. <laughs> this supposed to be rapid fire. <laughs> I'm the same. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Hamoud, for playing with us, Rapid Fire, and for sharing your story so far. Um, at this time, we're going to take a short commercial break. And sticking with the theme of female empowerment, we're going to play None the Other, Run the World Girls by Beyonce. Oh, <laughs> girls. <laughs> girls. I love your energy.
HES Academies have been serving the Detroit metro area for over 23 years, promoting academic excellence, leadership, and cultural diversity, ranking as some of the top schools in the state of Michigan. Our pre-K through 12th grade students enjoy tuition-free, state-accredited education by STEM-certified and highly qualified staff with no geographical restrictions and with advanced placement, college dual enrollment, scholarship, and Arabic language programs. Nor International Academy in Sterling Heights at niapsa.org. Star International Academy in Dearborn Heights and in Canton at starpsa.org. Universal Academy in Detroit at universalpsa.org and Universal Learning Academy in Westland at ulapsa.org. Join HES Academies today and enjoy a free Chromebook for every enrolled student. like 20 missed calls for my siblings. <laughs> 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 She's a trailblazer in the legal field, a champion for female empowerment, the chief deputy of the state of Michigan's attorney, attorney general's office, and now has joined the prestigious Joins Miller Johnson Law Firm. Please welcome Ms. Fedwa Hamoud. Let's get right back into it. start this process of making it the norm. And I think that we have to be each other's advocates in many of these cases. That it starts, it starts on a personal level. That when somebody is going to do uh, something that may hurt the overall mission, which is woman empowerment, of course. if that's what, then we have to be the first to stand up and speak up again up, about that, right? And then, and then also to help each other's back. And we can have each back, each other's backs in different spaces, not just in standing up for each other, but just in the simple things. Sometimes it's helping your your friend write a personal statement, right? Or mm -hmm. editing it for her. Knowing that somebody else's success is not going to take away from your in own individual success. So I think being there for each other in, in, in those ways is definitely the first step. Mm -hmm. And then the second step is also to make sure that we can continue to kick those doors open, but not just kick them open and then like get in mm -hmm. and then stay there alone. Yeah. But yeah. make sure that we continue to bring others in when we have those opportunities. Mm -hmm. These points are obviously very important. As a female in the legal field, what policy changes do you believe are necessary to promote gender equality in society? And what could we as young females do to bring society a step closer to this equality? So I think I think that, you know, even though we have come a long way, I think that we still have a long way to go. Right? Even when we think about affordable housing and some of the laws around there, that the majority of uh, individuals right now who are homeless, uh, who can't afford housing, unfortunately happen to be uh, single mothers. Uh, because of that financial strain as well, and, and, and really single mothers and mothers of color. So I think that within our policies, we have to start thinking about what equates to afford, what equates afford, affordable, right? What's affordable to me is not necessarily affordable to my friend that lives in another zip code mm -hmm. that lives so close. Yeah. So I think that that's a fair, we can have a long conversation and discussion as to all the policies, because I have plenty that I would absolutely like to change, right? 
but that's that's one simple example. But I think you know, in in terms of uh, not just policies, but how how we view people into these positions, it goes back to some of the same things that we talked about. To make sure that women are in boardrooms where they haven't belonged, right? That women can be the heads of institutions, but women can be mothers and do that. Right? Mm -hmm. People ask me. I had the most horrible comment made to me one day. They're like, do you ever want to take a break and be a mom? Oh my God. And uh, I was I was so offended by yeah. that. Because part of what I think makes me, part, part of my motherhood, part of me being a mom, my career, my job, that's how I choose to raise my kids, right? My kids know about those injustices that are happening around the world. That's part of my parenting. My kids are my my my, my aunt. When I have a meeting and I want to prepare for it, Matt and Julia are right there. <laughs> and I tell you what, when I went to the Supreme Court, it was some very complicated issues. My kids knew what the sticky notes on the wall said. <laughs> They help me with every single one of that. So it's, it's that woman shame, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very, 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 very important that we kind of break that barrier. Mm -hmm. When I, you know, I applied for an appointment for the school board, of, for the board of trustees and Dearborn Board of Education. And again, you know, I know I keep saying Julia because, uh, because well, it's woman empowerment, right? But I do believe that we should also raise our sons the way we raise our daughters in many ways and to mm -hmm. empower each other, Definitely. right? Like if I'm, if, if Julia and I are cleaning, you best believe Hattie's helping mm -hmm. us, right? If we are putting, you know, our play, Hattie is helping us, just yeah. like how I lady is helping us. That's that's what I mean about that. But um, now I lost my train of thought about, <laughs> what I'm about Julia, but. Yeah, I mean, every step of the way in my parenting is them being with me throughout this process. And we want to see the best for our kids. But I think part of it is we also should be able to show, especially as mothers, we should be able to show our daughters what, what the norm is and what they're capable of doing. And that is something to be uplifted. And I think that we can continue to uplift that once we have this alliance. It goes back to what your husband said. You you can either tell them or show, show them. them. Show them right Read now. by example. Yeah. And That's I cool. think Julia is probably the luckiest girl <laughs> in the world to have you as her mother. As oh. someone as successful, as impactful as you, yeah. it, wow. Mm -hmm. It's important to have a good role model, and she has one in the house. Yeah. yeah. And, and we have so many amazing role models mm -hmm. in, in our community, right? Mm -hmm. And and our our Julia is so lucky because she's also going to have you guys to look oh, at. We so need to have that going because mm -hmm. that's what it's about, right? It is a critical stage for us to continue to empower each other and to mm -hmm. continue to push each other into spaces where we have felt like we don't belong. Mm -hmm. And especially now, more than ever, with everything that's happening around the world, mm -hmm. we have to be laser focused on collective success and achievement, on collective success and achievement, and in order to keep keep going into spaces in every field where our voices are being heard, right? When people when people meet you, every single one of you, we, we talk about, you are carrying this community with you. And just by the nature of who you are, simply being you. When I went to the Lansing office, they, some of them have never met a Muslim. But yeah. just being in spaces, it makes a difference because mm -hmm. now when they think about the struggles of Muslims, they're going to think about me. When you go into these spaces, just by just by who you are, simply being you, you are helping causes that are beyond what you imagine you'd be able to do. Just for being the human that carries the values and the cultures that families have instilled in you for generations. That makes a difference, right? Mm -hmm. When we need people to know us, sympathize with us, it starts with them getting to know us, and that means us being in spaces, not just on their TVs, mm -hmm. but being in spaces and dominating those spaces. 
not just with our work ethic and with what we're capable of doing, but with our heart, because that's also how we, you know, as a community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where we're, we're so passionate. Like every single one of us should, should, it can be an attorney when it comes mm -hmm. to advocacy passion, because that's just, that's just who we are. We grew up, our parents for generations grew up fighting for, for them. Many of us came here because our parents wanted to have a better mm -hmm. education for us. They have mm -hmm. been our attorneys. They have been our counselors, our advocates in ways that, that you know, even without a degree. You know, they had the same opportunities. I, I mean, uh, I'm sure if my father had the same opportunities that I have, he can, he can be president. I'm without sure. a doubt. Mm -hmm. right, so we have to take advantage of these opportunities mm -hmm. that we have right now. Yeah. That was beautifully said. Yeah, I feel like I, I should be writing this down and taking it. <laughs> do, you, do you have any final thoughts or last minute advice you want to give us? Continue to be who you are in these spaces that you enter, right? Uh, and continue to carry your identity where you go. Uh, when I go into rooms, I make sure I say my name is Fadu, not Fadu. Mm. Because I want people to know who I am. Be proud of who you are. Be proud of all that you are and what you have to bring. And you must, must advocate for yourself and believe in yourself. And again, the rest of the world will believe in you. But it has to start with you. Mm -hmm. And we have to continue to build this alliance. Especially this alliance of amazing women, and that I think together we can achieve so much. And if if there's anything that gives me hope for the future, um, not just to change the policies that would eventually affect gender equality and, and others, uh, I think if anything gives me hope, period, with everything that's happening. It is young people like you that I know are going to enter into fields and really continue to advocate for, for those of us and for those individuals that need it most, right? Mm -hmm. That is advocacy on behalf of those that have the least amongst us, on behalf of those marginalized communities that need a voice, mm -hmm. both here and abroad. So you give me hope. Because you truly are the future, and I am very proud to live, especially after meeting you guys, but, you know, with amazing young people you know, across our state and across our country that continue to stand up for all the right things. I am very proud to live, at least here in this state and in this city, where there are amazing young women attorneys like you who are going to the world. Run the world. <laughs> we cannot take complete credit. We have amazing, amazing role models like you, truly. <laughs> as much as you say that the youth is in the hands of the youth, it's really, we would be nothing without yeah. people you like you. You guys everything, right? And But I think what we can do is uplift each other, yeah. right? And when, when you guys succeed, I succeed. When you, when, when you guys do great in your fields, it's going to reflect on me. It's going to reflect on every other person in this room, every other person in this building in your community. Uh, so I just want you to know that we continue to carry each other in those spaces. When I was at the Attorney General's office, I always said, this position is not mine. This is my community's position. And this was your position. So even if we didn't know each other, you were with me in those spaces, whether you liked it or not, <laughs> right? And even in my new journey in Miller Johnson, which I'm so very excited about, you will be with me, whether you like it or not. And I know in the journeys that you will take, I will be with you, and I know I will like it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for all the amazing things that you guys are going to continue to do and do. Together. Together. Spoken, truly beautifully spoken. Thank you so much, Fadu Hamoud, for sharing your insights and experiences with us today. It's been an absolute privilege having you on the show. And to all our listeners out there, if you could take one thing from Mr. Hamoud, is that you can do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. And remember, together we can make a difference. Stay tuned for more empowering conversations right here on the NAS radio station. This is Sarah Amin signing off. I 
DTS Academies have been serving the Detroit metro area for over 23 years, promoting academic excellence, leadership, and cultural diversity, ranking as some of the top schools in the state of Michigan. Our pre-K through 12th grade students enjoy tuition-free, state-accredited education